Real estate is math. Now, most of us are overcomplicating real estate investing today by skipping the fact that when you break down the fundamentals of this business, it all comes back to math. Now, I might have lost some of you guys just from saying that because if you're like me, I dropped out of college because I absolutely did not want to take any more math classes as well as not have a job. But when you break down this business and you come back to the fundamentals, there's only a few key formulas that every real estate investor must know in order to become successful in this business, especially over time. And today I'm gonna to go over these five key formulas that I use every day in my business, just like many other investors do. And let's go over those right now. All right, so I'm Tarl Yarber with Fixated Real Estate. So let's go over these five fundamentals in real estate that every investor must know in order to be successful in this business. Number one, everybody needs to know something called cash on cash return. Now cash on cash return can be calculated out in many different ways. The two ways that I like to look at it is you have actual return, your actual cash on cash return versus your project cash on cash return. Both are used a little bit differently. I use one of those more than the other. Now what is actual cash on cash return? So let's go to a new page. So I'm gonna go over actual cash on cash return first. Now what is actual cash on cash return? There's two ways to calculate this out. This is basically at the end of the day, your out of pocket expenses that you put into a deal, that money that you invested into a deal and the return you got. Now why I say there's two ways, real ways to do it is one of it is like a total return or your total return on a project such as a flip, right? And then another one is your annual return, your annual cash on cash, which would be like a rental or something like that in, in that way. So let's go over the simpler version of this and that is out of a flip. So let's say that you invested $10,000, sorry, let's say you earned $10,000 and that's your profit. You're gonna, you make $10,000 on a flip and you spend $100,000 in costs, right? So that's your out of pocket. What's important on that is that you actually spent that out of pocket. You invested it. Some things that you don't spend out of pocket on a flip are going to be like your escrow fees and all that kind of stuff when you go to sell a property. That's a different video for another day, but you don't actually incur those out of pocket, believe it or not. Now, anything that you came out of pocket, you purchased the property cash, maybe rehab was paid out of cash or holding costs is cash. Things that came out of your bank account and somewhere else that you had to invest that money. In order to get your total net uh, cash on cash return, you just divide the two numbers. Now, if you take $10,000 and divide it into divide it by 100,000, that's going to equal 10% cash on cash return. So you annualize the 10% cash on cash return based on those numbers there. Now, that's your actual return, right? Now, let's say that you take a rental instead. If you do a rental, and let's say that you're making $100 a month on a rental, that's your net income right? After all expenses and all including debt, we'll go over what net income is in a minute, but you're making hundred dollars a month. Now, if you just want to know what your annual is, then that's going to times it by 12 and you're going to know that you make $1,200 annual on that cash flow. Now let's say that you invested, you put a down payment of $10,000 into this rental. So if you had an annual, if you put $10,000 of actual out of pocket cost, and then as a rental is concerned, that means like your down payment, whatever, that kind of stuff. You invested that money to close on the property. You put $10,000 into it. $1,200 divided by 10,000 equals 12% cash on cash. That means your 10 grand is earning you 12% cash on cash. And in this, in this example, that's annual. So that's yearly. So that's an annual ROI, right? So that's a pretty good deal. And a 10% on a flip, I would argue is not that good of a deal, but it's still, you earn some money. Now, what I want to next go over is project cash, cash on cash return. Now, for those of you guys still with me, project cash on cash return is something I use every single day when it comes to flipping homes or burring, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Now, why do I use 
project cash on cash return for flips and burrs is because you cannot have a good burr without it being a good flip first. I believe that wholeheartedly. Now you can have a good flip, that's not a good burr, but you can't have a good burr without it being a good flip. So if that's the case, if I'm gonna analyze purchasing a flip using project cash on cash, which I'll show you how to do that, then I'm also gonna use that to analyze a burr as well. So project cash on cash return is, doesn't it matter what your out-of-pocket is, it matters what the project out-of-pocket cost is. Now what's the difference between those two? The difference is, is let's say that you buy a property for $100,000, is everybody going to purchase that cash or are some people going to buy it with financing? Now in this example, we're gonna use financing. So if I bought a project for 100 grand and let's say I got a debt on it with a hard money lender, I might get 80% of my financing covered, of my purchase covered through financing. That means 80,000 of the $100,000 purchase is covered by debt. And I only had to come up with 20% down, which is the $20,000. So in reality, my out of pocket's only 20 grand on a $100,000 purchase. Now, what I wanna know for project costs, cash on cash, is I wanna ignore my out of pocket and say all costs into the project, what's the return? So what does that mean? Let's say that we take the purchase price, we say the rehab costs, and we're gonna say any out of, any holding costs basically. In this example, right? So let's say you purchase for $100,000 and you rehab for $50,000, and then you got miscellaneous holding costs like your utilities, taxes, that kind of stuff. And let's just say that's another $10,000, right? So that means your total project costs is $160,000, right, in this example. Now, there's other factors in here. You're gonna have escrow, closing costs, sales costs if you go to sell this project, but those aren't project out-of-pocket costs. Those are, thing, those are not things that you'd pay out-of-pocket because they come at the back end on the project when you go to sell the property. As an example, if I sold this property for, let's say, $200,000, right, then I'm gonna pay uh, my, my escrow fees and real estate commissions out of that $200,000 proceeds, not out of pocket. Not that important today, but all that matters is this. Most of us know this number. If I sold this property for $200,000 and there's $40,000 left over here, did I actually make $40,000? No. For another video, we can go over all the expenses that come with selling a property, but in reality, let's just say it's about another in this example, let's say it's another $10,000 that it's gonna to take to be able to sell the property due to escrow fees, real estate commissions, and so forth. So we're gonna minus $10,000 in just costs to sell the property. It's probably not that much, but let's just say it is. Then that means $30,000 is going to be my net profit. That's what I'm gonna get. Now, what is my project cash on cash return? I'm gonna take this net profit that came from the project itself, and I'm going to divide it into the 100, or take the net project cost, sorry, and divide it into the net profit. So that's 30,000 divided by 160,000. And what does that equal? That equals 18.75%. 18.75% is the project cash on cash return. This is the only number I care about when I'm analyzing a deal. This means rate equals risk. Now, when I analyze my flips and I analyze my burrs, I'm analyzing the risk of the project based on this project cash on cash return. Now, where is it deceiving and where you can get destroyed when it comes to flips and burrs is if you get over cocky on your actual cash on cash return on a flip versus your project cash on cash return. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that let's say, let's get a new sheet of paper out. Let's say that I buy a property for $200,000 in this example, and that I, let's say, put $50,000 of rehab into it in this example. So that's purchase and this is rehab right? And let's say that I'm going to net, in this example, let's say I'm going to make, I don't know, $10,000 on 
the actual project, right? That's my net. Maybe it's a bad deal. Maybe it only sells for like, I don't know, like 325,000 or something like that. It doesn't sell for that much. But let's say that my net return is 10,000 bucks. So in this example, the project cost is $300,000. So that's the project cost, 200 plus 50,000, forget the holding cost for MathWise. And my net profit is only $10,000 in this example. If that's the case, what is my project, my project cash on cash return? That's a 3.33% cash on cash, project cash on cash return. That is a horrible, horrible, horrible flip. Because what if all of a sudden you, instead of paying $50,000 in rehab, you spent 60,000 or 55, or maybe, maybe it didn't sell for 300, it sold for 295, right? Just went down a little bit. You're making no money and you're probably gonna lose money. So that's a bad, bad flip. But how you can get over cocky and where you can overanalyze these deals and get really kind of messed up is if you instead aren't looking at project cash on cash return and instead you're looking at your actual cash on cash return. Now why, let's take this exact same example here. So in this exact same example here, you have a $200,000 purchase, a $50,000 rehab, right? But let's say that you finance all this stuff with a hard money lender somehow, right? So if you finance all this with a hard money lender, that's $300,000, right? And let's say that you got a 90%, which they are out there, 90% loan to cost hard money lenders exist out there. We run one of those, actually personally. But let's say you got 90% hard money costs, that is a 90% of your cost is covered of that. So in that example there, you, your reality, right, you only need to put 10% down, right? So you only need a 10% down payment on a 90% LTC, loan to cost deal with a hard money lender, that means your 10% down on a $300,000 project is only 30,000. So this is your out of pocket, your out of pocket on your actual cash on cash. So your out of pocket's 30. You're gonna net 10, right? So 10,000 into 30,000, what is that? That equals a 33% cash on cash return. That's awesome. You're getting a 33.33% cash on cash return. You invested $30,000 and you got $10,000 back. But what did I just say a second ago? That's a horrible, horrible, horrible deal, right? Because the project is going to measure the risk of the actual property. Don't get confused by this when you're flipping houses. Is this great? Yes, if I invested $30,000 in something and got 10 grand back, I think it's great. That's a great investment, but not always. Because what's the vehicle? What's the risk return? Rate equals risk. You're mitigating risk in this business. Now I'm going on a tangent on this one. This is the longest one we're gonna go over and then we're gonna go over the other ones, I swear. But we gotta measure risk in this business. Don't get caught up on just the dollars amounts you're making. Get caught up on the risk you are taking. And this deal, this property here, this flip, fix and flip that has a $300,000 cost, right, to come to it, has a very low return associated with it, which means that the risk is actually higher in this example because you don't have a margin of error. You cannot mess up. Everything has to be perfect in order for you to make your 10 grand. You can't mess up your rehab. You can't mess up your after repair value, right? That's what you sell the property for. You gotta be perfect or you're losing money and you can lose a lot of money. So keep that in mind. Actual return versus project return. Both are used for different ways. Use project return for flips. Don't use actual return for flips, in my opinion. Okay, did I spend enough time on cash out, cash return? Remember, we went over actual and we went over project and the big differences between the two. You use actual return all the time on rentals. I believe you should use project return when it comes to flips and purchasing burrs. Moving on, let's talk about the number two that everybody must know in this business, and that is NOI, net operating income. This is, now we're switching over to more of the rental projects or birds or whatever it might be, multifamily, single family, commercial, we all run on NOI when we buy these properties to keep. So let's get over NOI, or go over, not get over, we never wanna get NO, uh, over NOI. NOI is really, really simple. We're gonna take our gross rents, GR, gross rents, right? And let's say that it's gross rents, 
uh, monthly on this property is simple. Let's say it's a thousand dollars. Let's say we're getting a thousand dollars a month in gross rents. Cool. Now, in order to finish calculating out NOI, we're going to subtract all operating expenses. So OPEX, all operating expenses. Now let's figure out what operating expenses is. So let's say that in this example, like the rest of it is good. We're going to bunch all operating expenses uh, and that into, into just, a whole, we're going to list them all out right now. Let's say that you have property management. Let's say that you also have your, uh, let's say you have taxes. We all have taxes right in there. Let's say you have CapEx, that's capital expenditures. Those are capital improvements, things that maybe something breaks down, whatever, like your roof. These aren't maintenance things like a doorknob and stuff. These are actually like big, big expenses. You got your maintenance. Let's not forget that, right? That just kind of comes up wear and tear and so forth, right? What else are we missing? We're also missing vacancy. So you're going to, you're going to calculate vacancy as well. Now vacancy is a rate. Like sometimes people calculate 8% vacancy. They calculate five. They're basically saying, what if they miss one month every now and then of payments because they're leasing up a new property. That's a vacancy rate, right? So you got maintenance, you got vacancy rate, you got CapEx, you got taxes, you got insurance. Let's never forget insurance. Insurance is awesome when you need it sucks when you don't. Uh, operating expenses kind of fits all this type in and any other random stuff that might come up kind of gets caught into the operating expenses. So you're going to take all of these numbers, right? And let's say that all of this equals out to, uh, let's say 350 bucks, right? So it costs $350 for your taxes, CapEx, OpEx, all that kind of stuff. You calculate it out. Now, what does that mean? You're going to take your gross rents of a thousand. You're going to minus 350 and your NOI in this project equals $650 a month. Whoop, whoop. That sounds good. Now we're missing a thing here, aren't we? We're missing something called debt, right? Now, not everybody buys projects with cash. We put debt on it. So net operating income is gross rents minus all expenses except debt. Now, how do you get net income? Net income is just one more thing minus debt. That's your principal and interest that you're paying on that loan, PI. So let's say your debt now on this property is $500 a month. That means your net income equals 150 a month. So you went from net operating income of 650 a month minus debt of 500 a month. Now you have your net income of 150 a month. Really important numbers to know especially when you're doing this business as a real estate investor. Real estate is math, my friends. This is just a positive with a bunch of negatives to hopefully get you a positive, right? Because if this number was a negative, not so good of a deal, unless you add something called internal rate of return. We're not going to go over that, but that's a bigger number that calculates when you sell the project. Boom, boom, boom. Not that important to know today. All right. The third number, these all build upon each other. Let's talk about cap rate. What the heck is a cap rate? You hear it in so many different ways. I'm going to go over the two most common ways that cap rate is used. Now, once again, we got actual cap rate versus market, actual versus market. And when you're just starting out, these can sound interchangeable, but they're not. They're very different, but they're extremely important. Let's go over actual first. Now, most of the time cap rate is going to be used in commercial and multifamily deals. A lot of times it's not used into single family deals quite as much. You do want to look at your cap rate absolutely freaking lutely on a single family, but you know, most people, most average investors aren't analyzing their specific cap rate. They're just looking at your annual return, blah, 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 uh, with some factors. And they're kind of guessing to be honest with you, most single family investors. But in reality, true investors are always looking at the cap rate as much as possible, especially their actual cap rate. Uh, and then when they go to sell, they're looking for a market cap rate. Market cap rate has more to do almost always with commercial and multifamily deals and very rarely has anything to do with single family deals, right? Just as an example. Now let's go over actual return, actual cap rate. All it is is your annual NOI divided by your purchase. Got it? But it also can also be your purchase plus costs, right? So your other rehab and all that type of stuff. So let's say that you rehab it or something like that. So it's basically your actual return. So in this example, let's say that you have a annual operating, sorry, net operating income annualized of $10,000, right? 
and let's say that the project cost you $100,000 for whatever reason, that means your cap rate is a 10%. That's a 10 cap. It almost looks like the actual cash on cash return on the other side, but this number gets a little bit different depending on the type of deals you're doing. So uh, this is how you analyze, you figure out your net operating income, your cap rate. This tells you what it is. It's a good deal, a 10 cap, very good deal. Now, where do people get confused is they look at a market cap and they go, wait a second, but why are people buying four caps, three caps, all that kind of stuff? And let me show you that. Now a market cap, right, in this example, market cap rate, is what does the market say the cap rate is in that area for a specific type of property or class of property? So let's say that you're doing a class A, that means really good, right? Multifamily in downtown, actually we'll use where I live here, Seattle, right? It's going to be somewhere around 4%, right? So you're going to have a 4% cap. That's saying that like, it's actually probably less than that right now. Uh, it's saying that in the market of Seattle, downtown Seattle, an A-class multifamily property is at a four cap. It's worth a four cap. Now, why is that better than a 10 cap? Because I would think that 10% is better than 4%, right? So here's what you want to do. You want to buy at a 10 cap if you can, and you want to sell at a market cap of four, right? Now, how you do that, has a, there's a lot of ways, and there's some way more detailed videos in there. But when you look at your market cap rate, you actually just have to do some basic math and some basic algebra, right, to be able to take the 4% and put it where it needs to be. So let's say in this example here, if you wanna find out what the, what the property is worth, then you're going to take your net operating income and you're going to divide it by 4%. And that's going to give you your ARV or appraised value, right? Value of the property. So in this example, that means that your property, if $10,000 divided by 4%, means that your property is worth $400,000. That means that your property is worth $250,000. Let's pretend the editor didn't put down that I wrote a wrong number there, huh? So that means that your property is worth 250,000. Now, why is that? That means that if you bought, if you have a net operating income of $10,000 and you're only getting a 4% rate of return on your money, that means you had to have bought it for $250,000. Why would anybody do that and why did that go up? You take the same deal here with the $10,000 operating expense, or sorry, net operating income, you bought it for 100. Now let's say that this property here was run down, messed up, all that great stuff, things that make a property under value, which is why you bought it at such a great deal. Then you fixed it up, made it better, made it awesome, right? All that great stuff. And that raised the value of the property. But in reality, maybe it was a class C property and you turned it into a class A property or more likely a class B than you turned it into an A, right? And you bought it at a discount somehow. Well, you then, even though in the, most of the time you're gonna raise your net operating income when you do that, but let's say that that stays fixed because your cost went up, your property value based on the market, market cap rate said that a class A property, even though you bought a B class property, is now worth 4% cap rate or worth 250,000, right? This is really important stuff when you're in a multifamily and commercial deals, right? It's how a lot of lenders are going to evaluate your property, how appraisers are going to look at things. And the key, quick side note, the key to getting the best return, right, for your property is buying at a high cap rate and selling at a low cap rate. Now, how you do that, you're going, it's pretty simple with cap rates, right? All you got to do is you want to increase your NOI, reduce your expenses, because when you do that, so when you, in order to increase, increase NOI, you increase rents and you reduce expenses. That makes your NOI bigger, right? Which makes this number bigger. And then your multiplier changes by the quality of the property and the market you're in. And that raises your value, right? You want more videos on that? Check out Bigger Pockets. There's lots on there. There's a lot of other people that talk about cap rate and how to raise value in commercial properties. But keep in mind, actual versus market, there's a big difference. Who would have thought that these equations were so long? Let's go over the fourth one. The fourth one that's most important to me is D S C R. What the hell is that? Debt service coverage ratio. Boom. That is confusing. What the heck is a debt service coverage ratio? And why is it so important? D S C R. All right. 
debt service coverage ratio. You have a lot of factors in here. You have your cash on cash return that came up. You have your net operating income, which affects DSCR. You have your cap rate, which can also, believe it or not, affect this in some way, but most of the time it doesn't. So, and now you have your DSCR. So if you're keeping a property, you're gonna refinance it, right? You're going to be able to purchase it uh, with another lender. DSCR comes very imp is a very important number that all of us must know. And it's especially important when you're dealing with asset-based lenders. Asset-based lenders are different than your Fannie and Freddie-based lenders that are just looking at you as a borrower. A Fannie, Freddie, some of the conventional, that kind of stuff, bar a lender is just looking at you. They're looking at your debt to income ratio and your credit score. Can you afford the payment and do you have good credit history? Right, that's basically what they're looking at. Debt service coverage ratio lenders or asset-based lenders are looking at the asset. So they're looking at what are the, what's the income of the property and can it cover the debt? So basically all a debt service coverage ratio is, is it's the ratio of income to the property versus the debt. So let's go over that. It's a very simple equation, kinda. It's NOI divided by debt. Pretty simple. Now debt is typically just gonna be your PI, right? That's your principal and interest. Now most of us have PITI, P-I-T-I, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, but TI, taxes and insurance, is part of the net operating income equation already, so it only needs to add in the PI, the principal and interest, or interest if you're doing interest only, of the debt. Now why this is, can be a very simple formula is we already figured out NOI, right, on a property, and that's an easy thing, it's just gross rents minus all expenses. So let's go back to that one uh, equation we had. We had, a gross, we had a gross rents of 1,000, and we said that our expenses were 350, right? So that means it is 650 NOI. Now remember, NOI is everything before debt, all right? Now we're going to divide that by debt. Now, let's say that our principal interest is also 650. What is the ratio? What's 650 divided by 650 equals 1.0. That means the debt service coverage ratio is a 1.0. It equals out. Now let's say instead we have a 650 NOI, <laughs> NOI. Actually, let's do easier math for me, all right? Please, sorry guys. Let's say that our NOI is $1,000 a month. Oops, for, sorry guys, $1,000 a month NOI. And our payment to our mortgage lender is $500 a month. So what's 1,000 into that? That equals 2.0. That's a great debt service coverage ratio. This is an even one, breaks even. This is an awesome one, it's double break even. That's an awesome one, period. So if you have a property that's doing a 2.0 2 DSCR, keep it, don't get rid of it ever, don't sell it, don't flip it, especially in today's market. So keep it. But what does this mean as a lender? And just a quick side note, as a lender, like we, we lend, where, but if, just as a quick side note when it comes to this, is that we're looking at the risk. So a, debt, a lender is going to look at you as saying like your debt service coverage ratio is basically telling the lender on an asset-based loan that the rent, NOI, <laughs> the NOI is enough money to cover the debt with enough buffer of risk as well, right? Most debt service coverage ratio lenders are gonna look for like a 1.2, right? 1.2 plus. Some will go down to 1.1, some are 1.3, but on average, a lot of them are 1.2 plus. What does that mean? It means that if you have a $1,200 NOI and a monthly payment of 1,000, that's a 1.2. That means you need to at least have a $1,200 a month rent to cover the debt to make a 1.2 or else the lender is not going to lend or they're going to have to reduce your mortgage balance. Now where this gets feisty, right, is let's say that this just happened to me. I had a property that just appraised for $490,000, right? So high, high appraisal, let's call it 500 for simple math. Most lenders are gonna give me a 75% cash out refi on a $500,000 appraised value property. 75% cash out is $400,000. So I should be able to get debt at 400,000. Now, what if my rents don't give me a 1.2 debt service coverage ratio at $400,000. What that means is that we have to then lower the amount of money I borrow from the lender in order to get my DSCR up to 1.2 because of the monthly payment. 
That just happened to a lot of investors out there that are uh, looking at higher interest rates today than when they originally started doing this business. Rates have gone up, therefore their payments have gone up and maybe rents haven't caught up yet. So their debt service coverage ratio has just reduced, which meant they can't borrow as much on the back end of their burr financing. So watch out for that. All right, and last but not least, an important equation that I use every single day, right, is our max offer price or max purchase price. Now I use this for my burrs and my flips. When it comes to rentals, there's a different equation that you're going to use. Use the great rental calculator on biggerpockets.com. It's one of the best ones out there for rentals for sure. But if you're doing a quick dirty analysis on a burr or a flip, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a max offer slash purchase price through that. All right, so let's just call it max purchase price for now, right? So this is what you're gonna be putting your offer on to be able to find out what's the maximum amount you wanna pay for a property, especially if you're flipping it. And it's pretty simple. You're gonna take the after repair value, ARV, right? You're going to back out the profit you wanna make, right? You wanna back out your rehab, right, and costs, right? And that's gonna equal out to your max purchase price. Pretty straightforward. After repair value, minus whatever profit you wanna make, minus your rehab and other costs into the deal is gonna be come up with your max purchase price. Now this other costs here include your holding costs, your other expenses, your escrows, your fees. So this is an expanded uh, aspect here. It's not just simple as a cost. You can estimate that if you want to, usually a percentage, like three to 5% of the deal, most of the time is gonna to have to come out just for that, maybe even more depending on where you're at. So uh, now jumping over to, to a different version of how to use this, this is where the 70% rule comes in. So when people hear the 70% rule, it actually comes from a max purchase price. What that is, is it's ARV times 70% minus rehab. So you're basically gonna take 70% of the ARV and back out rehab, and that should be your max purchase price using the 70% rule. I don't use this rule. I like to get a lot more specific than guessing on my numbers. So I go back to my max purchase price equation here to break down all my costs and my rehab. And I don't even figure out the profit, I figure out my cash on cash return that I wanna make. So that's where we things get a little different ladies and gentlemen, is I use cash on cash project return with a max purchase price equation. Bam, that's how I actually find out what I'm gonna buy my properties for because I wanna get at least a 15% cash on cash project return on all my burrs and all my flips minimum. And how I gotta figure that out is figure this equation out actually a little bit, a little bit differently as a percentage, not just a dollar amount. And that's what Excel's for and also your calculators on bigger, pro bigger pockets. Right. So let's give you guys a quick example of this. Let's say you have a $300,000 ARV, you have a $50,000 rehab, and you also have, uh, sorry, you want to make $50,000 profit, and you're going to have a $50,000 rehab, right? And let's say you have another 10 grand in costs, right? That means your max purchase price in, the ex in this example should be $190,000. Because if you bought it for 190, rehabbed it for 50, had an extra 10K in, in expenses, then you're gonna wind up with $50,000 profit, selling it for $300,000 max after repair value. All right, so that was a lot, guys. I went into a lot of detail for those five equations that I like to go over every, over every single day in my business. And, for some, and there's a lot more out there. There's IRR, internal rate of return. There's gross rent multiplier. There's a bunch of different things out there that you can geek out on in this business for sure. I believe at the end of the day, it kind of comes back to these five, cash on cash, NOI, cap rate, DSCR, and what's your max purchase price and how you're gonna do it, especially in today's market. Going back to the fundamentals is more important than ever. So I'm Tarly Garber. Make sure you guys comment, like, subscribe here on the video with Bigger Pockets, and I'll see you on the next one.